All right, uh, so I have now started uh, the recording, hopefully. Um, so we can finally get started uh, with the main topic of uh, today's workshop of uh, starting with data in R. Uh, so before we get started with today's uh, content, I just wanted to give a little bit of a summary of what we covered last time. And we did quite a lot of things. We uh, learned how to navigate the RStudio GUI, uh, we learned how to install packages to access uh, additional functionality in R. We learned how to do some simple um, math in R. We got started with various programming terms like objects and assigning values to those objects. Uh, we learned how to um, use functions and how to define the arguments of those functions, how to get help uh, if we're not sure how to use a function. Uh, and we also talked a bit about uh, vectors. Uh, we mostly worked with um, character vectors and uh, some doubles. Um, and we saw how we can create and manipulate them. Um, and we ran out of time a little bit uh, when it was time to talk about missing data. Um, so if that is something you'd like to learn more about, do let me know um, and we will add that um, in the next workshop. Uh, but today uh, we'll switch gears and talk about data. So we'll learn how to read data into R. We'll learn how to understand and manipulate data frames. Uh, we'll talk about factors, which are basically um, what R uses for categorical data. And time allowing, we'll play around a bit with alternating between different date formats. So getting started with data frames. So data frames are the standard data structure that we use for tabular data in R. They look very similar to spreadsheets, um, like what you would see if you opened up Excel. But one key difference is that each column in a data frame is in fact a vector. So as you may remember from last week, um, because the columns are all vectors, they must all be um, of the same type. So the values within the vector must all be of the same type, right? You can't mix um, characters and numbers in the same uh, vector uh, and have them retain those features. R will coerce them into a common data structure. So on top of that kind of restriction of all values in a column or vector must be of the same type, each uh, vector also needs to be of the same length uh, to be part of a data frame. So data frames make perfectly rectangular shapes. Um, they don't have to be squares, uh, but they must be perfectly rectangular. So you can't have uh, a column that is slightly shorter or slightly longer than the rest. And just a bit of a note on terminology. Uh, technically, what we will actually be working with for all of these workshops isn't data frames. Instead, we will be working with something called tibbles. Um, I don't really want you to care about the difference between data frames and tibbles at this point. Uh, it's just that the name tibbles will come up um, quite a bit during the workshop, and I don't want you to be confused. They're basically the same thing. Um, there are subtle differences, but it's nothing that you need to worry about. So. Uh, data frames and tibbles, um, I may be using them interchangeably during the workshop. Um, and I did also want to talk a little bit about good data organization uh, when talking about tabular data. My background is in research data management, so I couldn't resist. Um, but basically, uh, in these workshops, we will be working with the concept of uh, tidy data. And tidy data is a standard way of mapping the meaning of a data set to its, its structure, which sounds a little bit vague, uh, but I think this explanation does um, clarify things quite a lot. So in tidy data, each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, and each cell is a single measurement. So if we look at this little kind of like toy example over here, we can see that we have uh, three columns, which are all variables. So for example, the first one is um, an identifier for the mysterious creatures that were um, you know, investigated in this experiment. Um, another variable is uh, the name of 
these cats uh, and the color that each cat had. Um, and we have six uh, rows, which means that there were six observations, um, which means that there were six cats that were observed um, for this experiment or whatever it was. Um, and notice that each cell here is also a single measurement. So we only have the name here. We don't have, I don't know, like name underscore age and have two things in the same cell. Um, each uh, cell should only have one measurement, not multiple ones. So that is tidy data in a nutshell. Um, it probably is quite similar to how you've been working with data, perhaps. Uh, so, you know, if this doesn't seem particularly, you know, mind blowing to you, don't worry about it. It's not like a, uh, a huge revelation or anything. It's just um, a way that we like to structure data. And you may be wondering why uh, that is a good idea. So there are two reasons why I think working with tidy data um, makes a lot of sense, especially in the context of R. Um, the first reason is consistency. So as we can see in this quote over here, um, the standard structure of tidy data means that all uh, the tidy data sets are all alike, but every messy data set is messy in its own way. Uh, what this consistency allows us to do is um, create tools that all have the same assumptions for the underlying um, you know, architecture of our data. And when those assumptions are in place, then you can be more straightforward um, and efficient with how you build your data workflows. So for example, if you want to use three tools um, in your workflow, and all of those tools require your data to look slightly different, then you know after you do the first thing you wanted to do, you have to change the shape of your data to make it match the structure that the second tool wants. Um, and then you have to do the same thing again uh, for the third tool. And that's just not really a very good use of anyone's time. So um, this is an argument for consistency and you know, data structure in general. It doesn't have to be the tidy data structure, it just has to be a data structure. Tidy data in the sense that uh, variables are um, columns uh, is useful in the context of R because it allows us to take advantage of the vectorized nature of R. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically if you put your variables in columns, it means that your functions can be faster and more efficient. So those are the two main reasons why we're going to be sticking with this tidy data structure of uh, columns or variables, observations or rows, and there's only a single observation in each cell. And um, this uh, fascinating topic of file formats, uh, again, sorry, research data management background, I have to say this. Um, I will give you a couple of options of uh, good file formats to be using when you are saving your uh, data. Um, so I know that you know researchers, a lot of the times uh, we open up our data in Excel to do some basic stuff and may be saving uh, data in an XLSX uh, file format. I would discourage you from doing that. Um, hopefully I'll have uh, time to do another workshop um, in the new year about um, working with tabular data. But uh, I can't. I don't have time to go into the specifics at the moment. But basically, um, it's a good idea to be using plain text uh, files for um, saving your data in. And the two options I said I will give you are uh, CSV files, so comma-separated value files, which are plain text files where the columns are separated by commas. Uh, a good thing about these files is that they are commonly used, and in fact, uh, that is the file format we'll be using today. Uh, but they can be annoying when the data itself contains commas. For example, if you come from uh, a part of the world, like I do, uh, where decimals are commas instead of um, full stops. So that can be a bit annoying. Um, my preferred file format is the TSV file, which is a tab separated uh, value file, which are also plain text files, but the columns are separated by tabs instead of commas. 
The great thing about that is that there's no confusion when the data itself contains commas or semicolons or whatever, um, but they are still not very commonly used. Um, so yeah, I know very exciting, but I do think it's important. Finally, we can talk about the data we will be uh, talking about in today's workshop. And this is uh, historic data of worldwide COVID-19 uh, positive cases and deaths. Uh, this data comes from the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and it covers the period from the 1st of January of 2020 to the 20th of June of 2022. Uh, this is a bit of a breakdown of the variables that those data have. Um, I won't talk about each of these variables at the moment, but it contains information like, you know, which country the data came from, uh, the population of that country, whether uh, an observation is a, a positive case or a death, um, the date at which uh, the observation was recorded, um, and the rate uh, of um, positive cases or um, deaths. Okay, and with that, uh, we can finally start doing things. So the first thing that I would like you to do is I would like you to go to your file explorer or finder um, and navigate to the folder where you created uh, your directory for this workshop, where the R project file is stored. So I'll give you um, a moment uh, to find that location. And when you are there, uh, maybe give us a green check mark. I can see a couple, I can see three. Cool, I can see a few. Can you repeat how to get to that, please? Sorry? Can you repeat how to get to that, please? Um, so you need to go to, did you create a project, uh, an R project for this uh, workshop? Oh, no, I didn't. I need to go back to the reading material and don't I? Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so you will have to, to create an R project. Um, if you can wait a moment, uh, I will show you how to do that once I open R. Um, so... Basically, uh, if you found the folder where your R project is, what I want you to do is uh, double click on the R project. And uh, that will open up our studio. And what I want you to check is that in this uh, top right corner over here, you have uh, a project that is open. Um, and if you also look at um, this tab over here, the files tab, you should be able to see the uh, R project uh, file and a scripts folder that we created last week. Um, if you did not create an R project, you can do so by clicking on this, um, on this uh, icon over here that has this yeah, cube with the R and the big uh, green sign. Uh, click on new directory, new project uh, and just follow that wizard along uh, and create an R project. I won't do that uh, because uh, I don't want to confuse anyone. So uh, hopefully everyone was able to uh, open their R project um, and see those files um, that I was just talking about. If anyone is having issues with this, uh, please let us know because I mentioned last time something about relative files versus absolute path, uh, relative paths versus absolute paths. Um, this is this is the moment where uh, things break if you don't have um, relative paths sometimes. So, I'll um, if if you are having any issues with this, uh, do give us a, a red a red cross, and we'll try to help you because this could derail things a little bit. But I don't see anything, uh, in which case I will um, just move on. So the first thing that I want to do, and the thing that I just closed is the script that I was working on last week. Uh, I don't need that anymore. We'll make a new script for today in a moment. 
Um, but the first thing that we need to do is we need to keep um, expanding our folder structure to make some space um, to save our data in. So um, if you remember last time I talked about um, a folder structure that I like to have in my projects where I separate uh, my code or what I call I call them scripts um, from my data, and I also like to separate my data, my raw data from my clean data, because once you read in your raw data, you should not touch it anymore. All the edits or manipulations that you make uh, to your data sets um, should be done in a script, um, and you know the output should be saved separately. That is a way that you never mess up uh, your data and you know like lose your original file and then you don't know what was there to begin with and what it is that you added yourself. Okay, so uh, I'm going to create. Um, oops, whoops, I'm going to create um, a new uh, folder and I'm going to use a function to do that. Last time we used this icon that. Uh, lets you create a folder. You can also do that. Uh, I also want to show you how to do it from the terminal um, or the console, sorry. So uh, this is a function. So like with uh, the R functions we saw previously, you write the name of the function, which is dir um, full stop create. We open and close parentheses um, as always. And for this, I also need quotation marks. So I have opened and closed some quotation marks. And now I'm going to write the name of the folder that I want to create, and that is data underscore row. So now that I have done this, I will click on the enter or return key to run this command. And you can see that in my files, uh, in my files tab, a new folder has appeared called data raw. Uh, so I will repeat this for um, the other folder that I want to create, which is data clean, which is where we would save um, the data after we have wrangled it and made it pretty. Uh, and again, I'm going to click on the enter or return button to run this code. And again, I see a uh, folder appear in my uh, files tab. So hopefully everyone was able to do that. If you weren't able to do that, please give us um, a red X. I see a red X. And that's me, Irini. I'm still unpacking. I'm still installing all the packages. Oh, okay. I haven't done beforehand, so it's taking some time. <laughs> um, but I should, should, I'm making a note of this, so I should be able to run everything fine. Okay. I will copy these commands when I make a script, yeah. put them at the top, so you'll be able to see them for a bit longer. Um, but yeah, the tidyverse is quite big, so it can take, um, it can take a bit uh, to install. Mm. All right, uh, so hopefully everyone's created those. If you don't already have the scripts folder, um, please also create that uh, with the same um, syntax that I used here. So dir uh, full stop create, open and close parentheses, and in quotation marks, uh, the name of the folder, which is scripts. So now that I have the folders for the files, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, download my data. So I am going to do this. Um, in one go. First, I want to download the data, right? And then I want to save it in my data raw folder that we just created. Um, but we don't have to do this manually. We can do it, um, yeah, we can do it with this command over here. So I'm just going to copy it um, and paste it over here. Um, you, oops, no, I don't know why I showed you my calendar. Um, since you don't have access to the, um, sorry, to the uh, slides yet, uh, I also copy pasted this code in the HackMD. So um, I just hid it a little bit. So um, underneath housekeeping, there's this like details kind of um, button uh, with this uh, triangle. 
if you click on it, uh, it will show what I have hidden, which is um, the code to download the file. So I just wanted to do that because uh, it's easier to make it work kind of quickly without, um, yeah, having to do too much manual work. So this is another function, the download.file function. Again, we have our parentheses where we add um, our arguments. So the first argument that we need uh, for the download file function is the URL where the data is found. Uh, and this is the URL. Uh, a second argument that I am using is this dest file argument, which stands for destination file. So here what I'm doing is I'm telling R where I want to save that file and what I wanted to call it. So I'm telling R I want you to save it in the data raw folder that I just created. And I want you to call this file uh, coviddata.csv. So if I run this now by pressing the enter command, uh, the enter button, uh, you should get something like this in the output that it's trying this URL and that something was downloaded. And if I now go and look into my data raw folder, you can see that uh, there is a file in it, which is pretty neat. And yeah, hopefully this also kind of helps demonstrate the usefulness of relative files. I wouldn't have been able to just give you, you know, a command that downloads something and puts it in the right place in your computer if I had to know, you know, the exact file, um, uh, the exact path um, where you are saving all of your files on your own personal computer. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that from last week a little bit. Did that work for everyone? Uh, is anyone struggling with this? So Irene, where do we get the HTTPS? Where do we get the URL from? Um, you can get it from the HackMD uh, ah. on line uh, 86 over here. Okay. And make sure you have created the folders beforehand, otherwise um, you may get some errors. So you'll need to have created the data raw folder. All right. Um, I don't see anyone yelling at me, so I think I can keep going. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I am going to create a new script for today uh, where I'll be writing things. So I just went over to this little icon with the white rectangle and the green, the round green button with the plus um, and clicked on our script. Sorry, I did that a bit quickly. It's just some things become automatic after a point. So you just do that and click on our script and that will create uh, a new script for you. Um, and as I promised, I will also copy these things and have them here as comments. So I'm just putting these here so you can still um, see them. Uh, it's not something that you would normally um, put in a script necessarily because you don't want to be doing these things every time that you run your script, uh, but I'm just doing this for convenience sake so that you can that you can see a record of what it is that um, we've run. All right, so that was a lot of prep work, um, but now we are finally almost ready to read in our data. So last time I asked you all to install a package that we will be using a lot. It's the uh, tidyverse package, which you can install with this command. Um, again, I'm going to comment this out uh, because it's not something you'd want to do every time you run a script. But if you haven't done that, um, you need to run this command of install.packages, open and close parentheses, open and close quotation marks and write tidyverse in the middle. 
but I assume that uh, you have done that. Uh, and then, sorry, um, what this command does, what this function does is, as it says, it installs the package. So it makes it available for us to choose if we want to use it. Um, but we have to choose that we want to use it in each uh, specific script. Uh, we need to load the package to be able to access um, the data, uh, to be able to access the functions that we want. Much like um, I just you know, downloaded the data um, that we'll be using, but it's not yet in my R environment. Um, I need to load the package that I installed uh, before I am able to use that. Um, and the function that you use to load a package is called library. So I type library, open and close parentheses, and you can see R gives me suggestions of all the things that I have installed, uh, which is many, but I will just type tidyverse. Uh, as you'll notice, I don't need the quotation marks for the library command, but I do need it for the install packages command. Okay, so now I can run this. Uh, because this is in my script, I don't just click on enter or return, but I click on control and enter or command return to run it. And I can see in the console that I get some outputs, R is telling me various things. Um, you don't really need to worry about what these things mean. Um, it's basically just telling me that these are the packages that you will be using um, now that you have loaded the Tidyverse package, because as I've mentioned a couple of times, I think, um, the Tidyverse package is actually a collection of packages. It's very meta, I know. Okay, so now that we have loaded, loaded our package, um, Sorry, I could hear a bit of echo. Um, now that we have loaded our package, uh, we can finally access the command that we want to read in our data. Um, and that function is the read underscore CSV function. So as I am writing this, you can see that R is already suggesting uh, this read underscore CSV function. It's also showing up with the read.csv function. This is not the function we want. This is the function we want, the read underscore CSV function. I know that's confusing and it feels like a very trivial difference, but they are two completely different functions. Uh, and this read underscore CSV function is the one that we want. Um, and then I need to tell R um, which file I want it uh, to read. And the file is, so I'm just going to pass the path. Uh, so it is, I have to open uh, quotation marks first. So my file is in the data row folder. So first I write uh, that level data row uh, slash and um, I can go look at what my data is called. It's called COVID data.csv. Uh, you perhaps will notice that it is exactly the same as this. I could have just copy and pasted it. Makes sense. Uh, here I told it I want you to take this file from the internet and put it in this exact location in my computer. And now I'm telling R I want you to take, you know, this file from this exact location from my computer and put it into R. Um, so if I just run this command, uh, I see that I get a bunch of output here in my console. Um, but you know, it's just in my console. It hasn't appeared in my environment, uh, which is because I have not assigned all of this data set onto an object. So I will do that with the assignment operator that we saw yes uh, that we saw last week. So I'm going to call my data my data frame um, COVID data um, and add the assignment operator so that basically the output of this function is taken and it is saved within this COVID data, uh, much like we did um, with 
just individual values and vectors last week. Okay, so if I run this now again uh, with command return or control enter, um, I see that this has done something. It has created an object in my uh, environment uh, called COVID data that has 53,074 observations um, in 11 variables, uh, which is great. Um, there are various ways in which I can uh, inspect that data. Um, as you can perhaps imagine, if I just um, do the thing that I did with my vectors um, last week and just run COVID data, it will do the same thing that uh, it did when I just run this command, right? It just prints it in the console. It's not a very easy thing for me to look at. So R also makes available um, a more spreadsheet-like view for data frames. So if I just type the function view, so view, open and close parentheses, and then COVID underscore data, the name of my data frame, and run this function. And wait for a moment. Uh, it opens up this view over here, which looks exactly like a spreadsheet. I would say this looks very similar to what it would have looked like um, if you had opened this file in Excel. An important difference, of course, is that you can't actually edit this. Like, I can't, I can't just change these values here. This is just uh, for convenience for me to be able to look at my data. Um, I can't actually interact with it uh, from this viewer. So that is the view function that allows me to open up this uh, spreadsheet view. A perhaps faster way to do that is if you go to the environment over here and click on the name of the, and I'll just make this a little bit bigger, um, and you click on the name of the data frame, it will do the same thing. So those are both, uh, you know, ways of doing exactly the same thing. In fact, if you look at the console, I've basically just run the same command twice. Um, is everyone following along? Is that uh, clear to everyone? Yep, I see some thumbs up. I see some green ticks. Excellent. Okay, great. So we have now read in our data. Uh, Tim, yeah. Sorry, I was just trying to put the thumb down and I clicked the hand up and said, no questions. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so now that we were able to um, view our, um, our data, uh, we may want to interrogate what it looks like um, in various ways. So we might be interested uh, in the size of our data. So, of course, this information is also available here, but um, you can also get it you know, programmatically with a function. So for example, you could write uh, DIM for dimensions and then pass the name of the data frame, in this case, COVID data, and run this function. And this returns um, the dimensions of our data frame that it has 53,074 rows uh, and 11 columns. I can also query those things independently with uh, n row for the data set. Oops. Um, so it tells me that the number of rows is 53,074 or n column for my data set. And now it just returns the number 11, which is the number of columns. So and I'll just add some uh, read in data. Um, size. Okay, um, so that just tells you some information about the data. It doesn't show you the content of the data itself. Um, 
if you want to get an idea of what you know the content of the data is and you don't want to like print the entire data set onto your uh, console which can be difficult to see um you can um you can use these commands of uh, head for your data set and that will print uh, the six first rows. Um, so you can see what those things look like a bit and it's a little compressed uh, or you can see uh, the last few uh, rows. Um, similarly, like here, so the our data set starts with um, values for Afghanistan and ends with values on Cyprus, which I find incredibly confusing. I assumed that <laughs> these were sorted alphabetically, but I was very surprised when I saw that the last year, the last country is Cyprus. But anyway, that's something we can find out how these are ordered, if they are ordered in any, uh, in any way. Um, something that I'd like to also mention about um, these uh, these functions over here is that they also take some optional arguments, um, which is the number of rows that they display. So their default is six. Um, but if I wanted to show uh, more or uh, fewer uh, rows, I can also go into the help for the function and see uh, how to do that. And I see that the argument uh, that I need is uh, n. So I could say here um, head uh, n equals 10, and that would give me uh, the first 10 rows instead of the first six rows, um, if that is something that was useful uh, for me. Uh, okay, so that is how you see, you know, like the beginning of your data set and the end of your data set. Um, you may also want to get a bit of a, a summary of what your data set looks like. Um, so there are quite a few functions that let you do that. And we've actually already mentioned one of them. Uh, you may recall the str function from last week. We used that to interrogate our vectors. You can also use that to interrogate your uh, data frames. So if I just try it, um, str and then, uh, sorry, not data, uh, COVID data and run this and look at my console over here, you see that I get a bunch of information. Um, when we did this with vectors, we got, well, we got its type, its length, um, and a few of the values here, you can see we're getting a lot more. We get the type of the entire um, data structure that we have here, which is a tibble, and that this is how R writes tibble for whatever reason. Uh, we get the dimensions of the entire data frame, which, as we've uh, learned, is 53,074 by 11. I actually don't know what this means, so I can't tell you. <laughs> and then we can see um, the individual columns uh, within the data frame. And as we mentioned, these are vectors. So we get uh, the type of the vector, the length of the vector, which has to be exactly the same length always, um, and the first few um, the first few values for that vector, and we get that for each one. I actually don't love this function for data frames. I think it's a bit too messy. It tells me too many things, and it's a bit hard to look at. So one that I prefer to use is glimpse. This is something that is available through the tidyverse package. So if you don't have that loaded, uh, you won't be able to use this command, this function. Um, but I think it's nicer. It's a lot, it's a lot neater, I think. Um, so yeah, it tells me the number of rows and the number of columns. And for each um, column, uh, it tells me it's uh, character, it's a data type and as many values as will fit into my console. So I think that's just a bit neater looking. If you're working with a lot of uh, numeric um, data in your data frame, a handy function to be aware of is a summary, which 
displays uh, some common uh, descriptive statistics for those um, for those vectors that are numeric. So it calculates the minimum, the first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, and maximum. So that is quite handy uh, if you have uh, numbers in your data. If you have characters, yeah, it's it's not as useful. But you know, if you need some quick um, summary statistics, uh, quick uh, descriptive statistics for uh, your data, summary is good uh, is a good function to know about. Um, yeah, and I think we might be ready for our first exercise. Are we? No, I think not quite yet. Um, oops, I need to stop showing you my email, <laughs> apologies. Um, yes, this is the one I want. Um, I guess Outlook and R just have a similar enough color that I keep getting confused. Okay, the next thing that I wanted to talk about actually is uh, how you can index and uh, subset uh, data frames. Mm, indexing and subsetting. So if you followed last week's um, workshop, you will remember the square notation, the square bracket notation that we used last time. But just to recap a bit, um, so if I create a vector uh, with this C function, stands for concatenate, um, and we had just like some numbers of cases uh, for COVID, and I run this function, I've now created uh, a vector called COVID cases. Um, and remember, I could use um, square brackets uh, to access individual elements within my vector. So what I do is I write the name of the vector, I open and close these square brackets. Um, and if I write the number two, uh, it returns the second element of my vector. Um, I think I actually didn't mention this last time, but it is handy to know if you program in other languages like Python. Python indexes starting at zero. So if you want to index, if you want to access the first element of something in Python, you would write zero here instead of one. Uh, in R, you write one. So when you write the number two here, uh, it gives you the second element. Um, but yeah, if you were a Python person coming into this and you wrote the number two in these square brackets, you might expect it to be um, the third number. So that's just something to be aware of uh, if you're experienced with um, other kinds of programming languages. So this is how you can um, kind of access the content of um, vectors. For data frames, we can do something really, really similar. Um, so if I now write COVID data, my data frame, and I open and close my square brackets, um, I can write the number one. Uh, and you can think of this, you, you can think of our data frame as, you know, like in Cartesian, you know, like coordinates, you just need to know the two axes, right? Um, the, the horizontal and the vertical axes and be able to pinpoint, um, and you'll be able to pinpoint values based on those coordinates that you have. Um, so we need to know how much down to go and how much uh, to the right to go. Um, so here I need to pass two numbers that tell R um, that information. So if I just tell R, um, tell, give me, you know, COVID data one, one, um, it will give me the first um, element, uh, the, fir the first observation in the first column of the data set. Um, so if I remember correctly, uh, this is like this. So the first number gives you the row and the second number gives you the column. So this gives me the first row and the first column. And if I say 
COVID data. And then I want one, two. This will give me um, for the first observation, the second column and so on and so forth. And I, you can play around with this just to get a handle for it. So if you do two point, uh, two comma one, this will give you um, the second observation for the first column, which actually will still be Afghanistan. So let's do, I don't know, 234. Um, okay, that's still Afghanistan. <laughs> 290. Okay, uh, this has now changed. We're finished with the observations from um, Afghanistan and we have somehow made it to Africa. Um, which should be telling you that whoever named these columns did not do a great job because obviously Africa is not a country. <laughs> um, so uh, next week we'll, in our cleaning, we'll probably be renaming this column to be a little bit more accurate. But anyway, uh, so this gives me the 290th uh, row uh, in the first column. So this is how you can access um, individual cells uh, within a data frame. Uh, you may be interested in accessing an entire row or an entire column from a data set. So you can do that by, um, so if you want to access an entire row, you let's say you want to access the entire first row, you would type one comma, and you would just leave the second location blank um, and what that means is just give me all of them. So for the first row, give me all of the columns. And if I run this, that is exactly what I get. Um, I get all the all of the columns for the first observation. I guess people usually want to access entire columns as opposed to entire rows. Uh, so, there is a bit of a shorthand uh, to access an entire column, and it is just to um, enter the, the number of the column that you want to access. So if you want to access the first column, you write COVID data in just one, and that will give you the first column. Uh, or you can write, uh, or you can access you know, the fifth column, let's say, um, like so. If you want to be very clear that this is uh, that what you want is the, the column, um, especially as you're getting started and you're still trying to get your head around which order you put the rows in the columns, you can be super explicit and write it like so, and that will give you exactly the same output. So, like, just adding, saying like, I want all the, I want all the rows only for column five. So that is how you would do that. I seem to have lost my terminal for a bit. Come back, and there it is. All right, uh, so that is how you access kind of like individual, you know, elements, uh, how you access a single cell or a single column or a single row. If you want to access multiple columns or multiple rows, um, you need um, a special kind of like operator, uh, the colon sign, um, which it's a bit easier if you just see it actually. So if I go to COVID data, let's say that I want the first six rows for, let's say, all of my columns, right? So that kind of replicates the behavior that we saw with uh, the head function. So if you wanted the first six columns, you write it like so, uh, the first six rows, sorry. Um, you say starting from one until six, give me all of these rows um, for um, every column. So when you use this column here, um, it's not just one and six, it's one, six, and everything in between. So if I just run this, you see that uh, it gave me rows one to six for every column. Um, yeah, 
and you can do that um, in any way that you like. You know, you can save it. You want um, all the rows for the first six columns, for example. You would get something like this. Or you could say, you know, that you want the first six rows for the first six columns. You know, you can you can use this colon uh, notation in any part of that function. You're not limited to using it only for rows or only for columns or anything like that. Um, and you may have noticed that when I've been running all of these um, all of these functions, all of these commands, the output that I've been getting here in my console is that all of these things are tibbles. So these continue to be data frames, um, just smaller data frames compared to the original. So that is also the case when you just um, access a, a single um, a single column, which um, yes, COVID data has not been found because COVID data does not exist. It is COVID data. So if I run this now, so um, this is just the first column, uh, but it is still a tibble. It's just a tibble that has one column and fifty three thousand seventy four rows. Um, I could extract this as a vector if I wanted to do so, because remember, these columns and data frames are all vectors. So if I want to access that as a vector and extract it as a vector, I can do that. And there's two ways uh, in which I can do that. So the first one is quite similar to what I've been writing already. So what I've been writing is square brackets in one. If I have double square brackets, so exactly the same thing, only instead of having only one set of square brackets, I have two sets of square brackets and I now run this. Then I get this as a vector. So you can see that it prints the, the a lot of the thing. Um, and yeah, it doesn't tell me anymore that, you know, it's returned a tibble, right? Like it, you don't get this thing where it tells me it's a tibble of this dimensions and here are some of its values. It just returns, um, it, it returns it to me as a vector. Um, personally, I very rarely, if ever, use this notation because I find it hard to remember the order in which my um, in which my columns are. <laughs> so I prefer to call them by name. Uh, and the way in which you can do that in R is by typing COVID data. And then instead of using these square brackets, you can use the dollar sign. And you can see R already recognizes that I'm trying to access uh, the columns of um, the data frame. And it just tells me here are all the columns in your data frame, which one do you want? So let's say that I want, I don't know, the country. Uh, so if I run this now, um, it returns the entire uh, column as a vector. And I did a lot of talking just now. So I think it's time for me to stop uh, and time for you to try and uh, make sense of everything you've just heard. So we'll do a couple of exercises. Uh, if there are any questions uh, before we go to the exercises, now would be a great time to ask. Yes, right. So I may have not heard you explain it because I was trying to <laughs> download the the database. But um, 
when you open a new script, do you always have to download Tidyverse to it? That is a very good question. Um, you don't have to download the Tidyverse, so you don't have to do this whole install thing. All you need to do is run this command called library tidyverse or library whichever package. And what this does is it loads uh, all those functions that are available uh, in the tidyverse package and makes it possible for you to use them. So if either, even though I have the tidyverse installed, if I didn't have this package uh, loaded and I tried to use this function, uh, R would tell me that it doesn't recognize this function. So any function that you're using that comes from a package in a script, you need to load that, that script uh, at the beginning of your script. Does that okay. answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. So I, I work, because last week we installed the package, mm -hmm. right? So now that means that every time that I open a new script and I want to work with a package, I have to sort of open the library of the package. Is that it? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. I don't see any other questions. So I think we can go uh, on to the exercise. And if any questions come up, uh, you're very welcome to, to ask them later on. So now what I want you to do um, is create a tibble that contains only the last 250 observations of COVID data. So I want all the columns, but only the last 250 rows. Uh, I have a hint for you, um, if it's useful, that you can get the number of rows in a data set with the function end row, which we saw at the beginning of uh, the workshop today. So you could, for example, uh, create a new object uh, where you can save the information of how many rows um, COVID data has. So that hints one way in which you could solve this exercise. It is not the only way. Um, so yeah, I'll give you five minutes uh, for this. Um, if you, I've been talking for a long time, so even if you do finish in less than five minutes, um, please just like stretch your legs for like a minute or so. So I will stop talking, but I will be keeping an eye on the participants tab. So if anyone uh, like raises their hand or gives me an, a, a red cross, um, we can we can try and help them.
Okay, so that was five minutes. Um, I can see only two green uh, check marks on the uh, reactions panel. So if you have finished the exercise and just didn't click the check, uh, that's fine. If you could just do that now, that'd be great. If you are not really sure where to start and are quite stuck, um, give us an X um, and we'll give you a little bit more time. Cool, I see six. That's nice. That's over 50%. <laughs> um, I think that's ooh, or something in the chat. Oh. I'm sorry, Tim. Um, okay. It's okay. Um, Don't worry. I, I, I've done this sort of thing in R before, so I'm not. I'm reasonably confident about the square brackets and subsetting, et cetera. Um, but for some reason, I, yeah, the, the download command is not working. So. That is interesting. Uh, I'm sorry that that's happening. I have, no, no, I'm sure it's not your fault. Uh, but, you know, I'm- a Connection, always... so the error message is a connection with the server could not be established. Hmm. Uh, it's very strange. Copied and pasted, so I don't need this. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really sure. We can we can try to debug it uh, later if you want. Yeah, no, don't worry. I'm using the commands without running them. And I'm typing in the commands without running them. So fair enough. Um, yeah, we can try to debug it. Uh, I can also give you access to some other data. This is where I downloaded the data from. Um, so yeah, you can. I put the. I put yeah, don't worry. a link in the chat. So if you want, you can just go and download uh, the CSV file. Okay, um, cool. So there are two solutions to this. Um, so the materials on which I have based this workshop uh, recommend um, this solution. Uh, kind of um, where you create um, a variable with the number of uh, rows in the data set and, you know, uh, get the end of, uh, you know, okay, basically what you want to say is uh, give me the rows from number X to number Y, uh, and you want number Y to be the end of the data set and number X to be, you know, 250 uh, rows before that. So the way they recommend doing that is by kind of like calculating, you know, the start and the end um, of those two things. And then using the square bracket notation to say from this data, um, you know, from this row to that row, um, give me all of the columns uh, and save it in a data set. So that is one way to do it. Uh, the way that I would have done it if I had to do this in a, um, you know, in my data analysis pipeline is I would have just said, give me the last 250 using the tail function and just um, edit the N. Um, so yeah, these are two ways in which you could have done this. Um, are there any other ways in which people did this? Yeah, yeah, uh, Alexander as well. Uh, you can you can just like do the math in your head. Um, yeah, great. All right. Um, if anyone is struggling with this, please do let us know, um, and you know we'll try to catch you up with everything. But if that's all good, uh, let's do another exercise. Um, should be fairly straightforward. 
but what I would like you to do is to calculate the minimum and maximum values for um, the country's populations. Um, so what I want, so just to clarify, um, in that data, we have uh, a bunch of countries and information about the population of each of those countries. So we only have one observation for each of those countries. So in case that um, um, instruction is you know, confusing, what I'm asking is get me the lowest number for a population that a country or territory could have and the highest. So yeah, hopefully that clarifies. But and you have three minutes for this. Um, again, you've done a lot of listening to me, so I will I will give you those three minutes, even if you finish early. Okay, and that is three minutes. Um, I see some green tin green tick marks uh, in the reactions panel, but I'm not sure if they're from the previous exercise or uh, from this exercise. If you could make sure to, you know, take that down uh, if it's left over or um, yeah, let us know um, how this exercise went for you. I see some green checks. I see a thumbs up. All right. Nice. Seven check marks. Great. Um, so yeah, I think this was um, fairly straightforward. 
So the way I would do this is something like this. You can do it very explicitly, very step by step um, and save um, the population uh, column of the COVID data um, data set in a new vector and then get the min and max values for that um, for that uh, vector. You don't, oh my God, stop. Um, you don't have to do it so explicitly and so step by step. You could also do something like a minimum of uh, COVID data and then dollar sign uh, population. Um, and you can do max COVID data dollar sign population. Um, and you could save that. Um, this is implausibly big. I think this is again a continent um, population rather than a country population. Uh, but yeah, you could also save these uh, into a um, into a value, into an object. Sorry, uh, minimum population or something, um, and have that saved over here. This is what I would do um, for, you know, reporting things into my papers. Um, I mean, I like writing reports and papers and stuff in R Markdown, which we'll talk about in the last workshop. But this is the kind of thing that I would do to get, you know, numbers to report uh, in my papers, something like that. How would you find out which country this is? That is the number of the row. Yeah, um, that is a very good question. Um, Raphael, if you could maybe answer that uh, in the chat. Uh, it's not something we're covering today. We will get to play around with questions like this a bit more next week. So hold that thought. <laughs> um, okay, so that was the exercise. Um, the next thing that we'll be talking about uh, in the last half hour is uh, factors. So R has a special data class called the factor, which helps us deal with categorical data. Factors are super useful uh, and they contribute to making R particularly well suited to working with data. If you remember last week, I mentioned that um, R was created from stats by statisticians specifically for uh, questions around working with data, analyzing data, visualizing data. So the fact that R has this data class, the factor is one of those things that make, you know, like its ability to understand missing values. It's one of those features that makes it really, that makes it really handy to work with data in R. Um, factors can be a bit counterintuitive in how they work though. So they look like characters, they look like strings, right? Like how I was saying for countries, we have like Australia and Greece and the Netherlands, um, but they're not actually characters, they're integers uh, in the underlying structure. They're integers that have a label associated with them. And that label is that kind of more character type thing. Factors can be ordered uh, or they can be unordered. And they create a structured relationship between the different levels um, of the categorical variable. So levels is we, what we call the values um, in a categorical variable. So for example, if you have days of the week, um, you can tell that to R explicitly so that it knows how you know, Monday relates to Tuesday or Saturday relates to Friday or something. Um, you can also you know, just tell it um, that there is an explicit relationship between the, lab, the the levels of like a question in a survey. We'll see how to do that um, in a bit. So for example, you know, how to tell it what the relationship between low, medium, and high is, and that low is, you know, lower than medium. Um, once you have created a factor, it can only contain a predefined set of values. And these values are uh, what we call levels, as I've already mentioned a couple of times. Um, and yeah, as I said, while factors look and often behave like character vectors, R does treat them like integers. 
So if you are treating factors as if they are strings, do be careful. And I will show you an example in a moment of when things could go um, quite sideways um, if you're treating a factor as a character. All right, so with that, uh, let's look at how uh, we can create factors. Um, so if you recall, last week um, I was playing around with a character vector uh, with uh, country names. So I'd done that with this C function. So I added some, I'd added the names of countries that um, I was tracking how COVID was going in them because I myself or my family live in them. So I had uh, the United Kingdom in it and I had uh, the Netherlands and Greece, Germany and Australia. All right. So if I run this now, uh, this will be a character vector, right? So if I do a class to find out its data class, I'll see that countries is a factor, is a character, sorry. Okay. Um, but I want this to be um, a factor uh, in this specific case. So uh, I will do that using the factor function. Um, so I will open close parentheses. So we have this that tells R that what I'm going to put in it is going to be a factor. And I'm just going to copy this and put it inside here. And now instead of uh, being a character, this is going to be a factor. So, and now if I do class country, what does it say? It says factor over here. So now we have a factor. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that factors have a predefined um, set of levels in them. So we can access those levels in R with the function levels. So if I write levels and then countries and run this command, it will return um, the, yeah, the levels of the country factor. It's getting a little late in the day and my speech is getting slower, I am sorry. So you may notice that the order in which these levels are at the moment is not the order in which I gave R those uh, levels. So I had the United Kingdom first, but R returned Australia first. As you may be able to guess, these are ordered alphabetically. So if you don't tell R how to order these things, it will just go with alphabetical order. This may or may not be <laughs> what you want. Um, so R, of course, also gives you a way to specify the order in which your levels um, are. So you can do that by, so when you're creating um, the factor, um, when you use the factor function, you can also use uh, an argument that allows you to specify the order of the levels. Do, do, do. Um, arguments. So we can see that um, one of the arguments is called levels. It's an optional vector of the unique values as character strings that um, our vector can take. Okay, so let's try this. Um, let's uh, create countries again. Um, and I'm going to write 
with my factor function, which allows, allows me to access all of those things. I'm not going to write this again uh, because uh, this is the the um, because what I want is already saved um, in the countries uh, object, so I can just reuse that and just say countries, and I can specify uh, my levels by putting a comma to separate my arguments. So my optional argument levels equals, and now I want to pass a vector of um, the order of the levels that I want. So let's say that I want to do Greece first and then United Kingdom uh, and then Netherlands and then Australia and then Germany. There isn't really any rhyme or reason uh, in this order. It's just the order that I have chosen for whatever reason. So if I run this now and ask for the levels again, sorry, I forgot to add <laughs> a very important argument in this function of uh, which factors levels I want to look at. Okay, so now if I look at the levels again, uh, we can see that they are in the order in which I specified them to be. So they're no longer in alphabetical order, but they are in the order that I told R I want these uh, levels in. Um, you may not see immediately the value of this at the moment. Um, specifying the order of levels uh, for factors is something that I have to do a lot when I make plots. If I want to order things in a specific way in my plot, um, I usually do this by reordering the levels of my factor. So that is how you do that. Um, another uh, function uh, that is handy uh, if you want to find out how many levels uh, your factor has is n levels. So number of levels for uh, my factor. And this returns five. Um, Something else that is really useful um, is being able to rename your um, your factors. So sometimes you know you make a mistake or you know something that you a level that you called in a certain way at the beginning needs to be called something else. Um, for example, let's say that, I'm actually not happy with the fact that I called the Netherlands Netherlands, um, and I want to have called it the Netherlands instead. So how would I go by um, fixing that? Well, the tidyverse uh, gives you access to um, a package called Forecats, uh, which allows you to do um, quite advanced manipulation of factors. And we will be using a function from that package. It's called FCT for factor, presumably, underscore recode. And I'm looking at up, I'm looking at up over here in the help uh, because it tells me, um, you know, how to use it and examples, which is always super handy. Okay, so what I want to do is um, rename the level of the Netherlands. Um, so let's do FCT recode function that I want. And then I need to pass the vector that uh, has the level that I want to change. And then this is not super straightforward, but um, yeah, basically, This kind of helps me, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, how this works. Basically, you need to tell that this equals this, and it's not always clear which way around you need to put the thing that needs to be fixed and the thing that fixes it. And I'm pretty sure that different 
functions have those things the wrong way around or you know the opposite way around from each other um which is always confusing which is why um i open the help a lot of the times when um i do stuff like this because it's easy to forget um and this is a bit of a random rant but this is why part of why i really like the assignment arrow in r because it makes the directionality of things really really explicit when you just have an equal sign here um, you don't know if this is going in here or if this is going in here. So, okay. So what I want to do is do it this way. I'm pretty sure Netherlands equals Netherlands. Um, and you can see that that worked. Um, if I look at the levels now, uh, Netherlands is no longer Netherlands. It is now the Netherlands. Um, and if I'm happy with this, I can also um, overwrite my previous factor um, and have it be like so. All right. Um, another way in which you could have done this using the square brackets notation is by accessing the, the levels through the levels command. And then, okay, so let's just look at it. Um, these are the levels uh, of this factor, Greece, United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Australia, Germany. Uh, we learned with the square notation that we can access individual elements um, of this. So we could use the square notation to access one of these elements and replace it. So for example, here I could say in levels countries, find me the second um, the second value of this, so number two, and assign to it, you know, UK for whatever reason. Um, and if I do levels of countries now, you can see that the second element has been replaced with uh, UK instead of United Kingdom. So these things are functionally uh, equivalent. They do the same things. In R, <laughs> you can do the same thing in so many different ways. Um, so I hope that it's not confusing that I'm showing you a couple of ways in which you can do things. Um, my preferred way of doing this is this one because it's harder to mess up. Um, I don't, you know, like, if here I'd made um, a mistake, and when I told that that you know I want you to replace Netherlands with the Netherlands, if I'd made a typo um, and you know said replace um, Netherlands with the Netherlands, it would have thrown an error because it wouldn't have found this value um, in my factor. Whereas um, with this command, if United Kingdom wasn't actually the second level, level of my factor and say Australia was the second level of my factor, it would have still replaced Australia with UK. So it's easier to make, to make mistakes, I think, um, with this type of thing. But that's also kind of like my personal opinion. Um, I usually go uh, this route. Um, okay. I also mentioned that we have um, the ability to make ordered factors. So uh, I don't want to rank countries. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to create uh, a new factor and I'm going to call it ordered factor and use the factor function as we've seen uh, to create uh, my new factor vector. Um, and this vector is going to have um, three values of high, medium, and low. And if I want this to be an ordered factor, what I have to say is that ordered equals true. The default for this argument uh, is false. So by default, this function creates unordered um, 
unordered factors, unordered categorical data, uh, this creates um, ordinal categorical data, basically. Okay, so if I run this now and look at my levels, oh, sorry, I forgot to press on enter. So now I can see that I have my three um, my three levels. Um, give me one second. Um, I need to check my notes a bit. <laughs> I don't do this all of the time. Um, hmm. Oh, okay. So what I wanted to do is actually this. So I wanted to show this over here that uh, it knows that there is a relationship between those three levels. Uh, and it says that high is uh, lower than low, and that's lower than medium. Um, but yeah, when I did that with levels, uh, it just showed me the levels, it didn't show me the relationship. So I needed to have run this instead of just the levels of the factor. Okay, so I now have an ordered uh, factor. It's obviously not in the right order. Uh, this is not the order I would have expected. So I can fix that by um, specifying my levels um, explicitly with the command that I showed you before. Uh, so I want low to be first, I want medium, to be second, and I want high to be last. And I need to add a comma here to separate my arguments. And if I run this now, now I get um, the order that I would expect uh, for this ordered factor. So hopefully, um, that makes sense. One last thing that I want to show before we finish. I'm sorry we didn't have time to talk about dates. Um, if you really want to learn about dates, um, I'll make sure to cover that um, next time. Um, but yeah, one last thing that I wanted to show before we finish is, oops, over here, is I want to talk about um, converting factors. I mentioned that sometimes if you're not aware that factors are, you know, actually treated as integers by R, things can go kind of wrong. So uh, let's see when that happens. And it is when you convert factors, hint, hint. Um, okay, so we already have our countries um, factor. If we wanted to convert that into a character, vector instead of a factor vector. We could do that uh, by running the command as character and passing as an argument there our uh, countries factor. Uh, and if I now look at my um, the class of this new vector that I created, we can see that it is uh, a character. So that worked, which is great. Um, but let's say that I have a factor that is numeric, for example, years. So if I have um, if I create a new factor, for example, a factor, and then C, and then the numbers, I don't know. Like 
um, whatever. Okay, I have uh, my years factor and I can look at it. It is a factor, it has, it has these values. Um, if I try to convert it to numeric, you can see that that is very, very wrong. <laughs> um, so instead of using the, you know, the labels that we said are associated with the underlying integers for the factor, uh, are just took the underlying integers of the factor and turned them into a numeric. And that is how you go from, you know, 1456 to one instead. Um, so that is not ideal. Um, so please, yeah, just a, a reminder of why you need to be aware of the fact that factors are in fact integers underlyingly. All right, uh, are there any questions? All right. Um, in that case, I will just um, move on. Uh, yeah, we didn't have time to talk about dates. Um, I'll see if I can uh, if I can add something about dates when we start next time. But something that I do want to mention, and it doesn't matter if you don't know how to use um, R to work with dates for this is that um, different places in the world use very different conventions to write dates. Um, so you can see a map here of, you know, how different places do things. Um, I would very, very highly recommend that you use this standard whenever you're writing dates, or uh, perhaps this, where you start with the year, then you write the month, then you write the date because then people from you know, Europe and the US can both understand which date it is that you're, working, that you're talking about. Because you know, if someone wrote 1-12-2020, that could be the 1st of December of 2020, the way Europeans write it, or it could be the 12th of January of 2020, the way that Americans write it, for example. But if you write a 2020 1201, then no one is confused and no one understands which, um, which date you're talking about. So as a summary of what we talked about today, so we saw how we can read data into R. Uh, we talked about data frames and tibbles. We talked a little bit about factors. And I did not have time to tell you about date formats. Um, but I just want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will see you next week for data wrangling with dplyr and tidyr. Um, these are uh, some references for things that um, I showed you today.